So one of the uh, one of the things that I think we wanted to start talking uh, start off talking about was why uh, recently I think there's been a lot of flurry of activity regarding MBI history here, um, and not by just here at the college, but on the island generally. Uh, there's been a lot of activity that has been going on, and it seemed like that that was an appropriate topic for us to start out with today for the start of the series, and a topic that people might be interested in and also be able to contribute to. And so. Um, I would want to encourage everyone who's here also, because this is going to be a pretty easygoing conversation, I think. And so if you have things that you want to add or ask during the, you know, before the gong rings, so we don't just have the Q&A type of thing at the end, please feel free to do so. Because, uh, I mean, I've done one of these a couple of years ago and thought it was just best if it was uh, an open discussion and conversation among the various different people here. Um, when I, when at, someone asked me, you know, what are all the different things that go, are going on right now that make island history significant or relevant or make people interested in it? Because let's be honest, it's not as if that's a new phenomenon. That there have always been organizations and interested authors and different communities that were very interested in discussing and researching and exploring different facets of the island's history. But there's a kind of unique sense in the air right now that are swirling around because of a couple of different events. One of them is the Celebrate 250, which I think some of you might be familiar with, uh, a kind of um, a series of events tied to uh, the, the founding of the island or the founding of Somesville and uh, the history of the island. Those are being sponsored loosely, though it's, it's collaborative, but the overall sponsor is the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. And they have got just a whole litany of, of interrelated kind of Celebrate 250 events that are going on all summer long, from walking tours to classes that are being taught at the senior, uh, the, the senior college to uh, a film project that I think is underway and will be done by in, in the next couple of months. And so if, you know, if you even just open up a magazine or a local newspaper, you're going to see a whole series of events that allow different um, activities, allow different communities, people from away, people who live here you know, full time to all engage in kind of exploring island history. At the same time, I was actually kind of lucky, uh, as I was uh, telling David uh, when we talked on the phone a couple of weeks ago too, I was out of the country um, in the, I guess the winter, over the winter break, and came home to find an article about this group called the Friends of Island History Coalition, uh, which I, well, as soon as I read it, I said, I have to contact these folks. This is an amazing thing. Uh, it's, as some of you may know, a local, uh, I guess, loosely based organization that brings together uh, different interests or different uh, actors in exploring island history from local authors to libraries to historical societies, all coming together under one umbrella to sh both share what they're doing, but also plan for activities that could help or different projects that could really help facilitate the study and the discussion of island history, its relevance to larger type, types of themes, some of the ones we'll be talking about today. Uh, and I know it was funny because I remember at one of our meetings, I, I said to the group, wow, you know, this is kind of an amazing thing that all of these groups with these different interests could come together under one you know, umbrella organization and actually co you know, collaborate with each other. And people looked at me like I was crazy. Isn't that obvious? And, uh, <laughs> You know, I, don't, I, do, I do research work in, in, uh, in varieties of settings. I remember being in Michigan last year doing work on the project Dylan was talking about. And, and you know, I would go to this little historical society in, in you know, Adrian, Michigan. And, and I'd say, well, I'm going to be going to the Hudson Historical Society in a couple of days. Uh, who should I talk to there? And they said, why would you go there? <laughs> <laughs> they couldn't even tell me who the person was. They're like, oh, we don't know them. We, we've never actually been over there. But come on, that's Hudson. Why would you care? I mean, we're the place where everything happened. So the idea that actually the historical societies, all the different historical societies on the island, all the different libraries, different actors can come together, collaborate, cooperate, and really use that collaboration to, you know, from people who kind of impact island history at so many different levels, that's really generating a lot of opportunities for new, new kinds of um, collaborative projects, new types of explorations. And so it really is exciting right now, some of the things that are going on. And, and, and the third thing I, I mentioned when people ask me about what's, what's going on in the community right now is even here at the college, there are some things that are going on. And, and that will emerge maybe in our conversation a little bit, but I think that uh, there are some new projects that students are undertaking. I actually had students come up to me and talk to me about senior projects for next year that would be archiving and documenting projects. Um, basic, you know, tightly defined projects that would allow them to explore island history in some new ways while also preserving it and leaving a, leaving a legacy for others who might want to do additional work on it. So 
You know, it was in that sense that I think uh, we decided that it, you know, it'd be fun to talk about that today and to have someone like David here who could, could also help facilitate that conversation as well. So, you know, that's kind of one of the reasons why we got started on this topic. Sort of um, as a way into this, David, I wonder if I can ask you, um, I know that you're sort of fond of the idea that you can ask big questions about small places or look for big answers in small places, sort of the, uh, the Charles Joy idea. I was wondering if you wanted to speak a little bit about how that informs your treatment of history as a whole. Yes, thanks, Dylan. I'd like to begin by saying, first of all, good morning to everybody here. And uh, this is going to be a troika, I, 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 I think, is the we worked it all out in some detail. But most of all, this is our subject. This is a subject that people in this, I think everybody in this room has in, in their bones. Uh, you all know more about this than we do in many ways, and I hope we can have a conversation that way, both before and after the bell, uh, that will tell us when we have to stop. But let me begin with the question that Dylan, let me say one point about this. Dylan, I believe you have been leading historical tours on the island recently. Is that, uh, is that yeah. correct? So you can come into this with that uh, perspective, uh, hopefully, and, and then uh, Jamie with the work that's been going on with college. But uh, my students, um, uh, 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 tell me uh, that local history, in their words, is hot today. And it's been heating up in several ways. Uh, the ways that you just described, uh, and the, the, the ways that you meet when you go on your tours. And then something else has been happening. Quite a lot of very serious scholarship has been happening in, in local history by people who are not historians. They're, they're finding ways of solving problems. Let me give you a couple of quick examples. Uh, one of them uh, is uh, on uh, demography. And the great problem, the, the large question in the, the, there was about how and when and why do people choose to control or limit their fertility. And uh, this is what became an international problem. And the major work was first done in Paris at a, a great center called the Institut National d'Etudes Demographique, a center for demographic studies in Paris. And a, and a demographer named Louis Henri uh, thought that the really interesting answers in Switzerland and France actually happened uh, before uh, the major demographic data began to be collected. Uh, it happened in the 17th and 18th century. So he invented a method called family reconstitution, in which a small area, such as Mount Desert Island, would be studied in a very particular way. The, the, the vital data would be gathered as it has been gathered and is being gathered on this island. Uh, and then every family would be reconstituted from that data over a very extended period, in most cases about two to three centuries. Uh, and this was first done in France, but then it spread to the United States. And uh, I got into it with my students, and we had teams of students doing uh, their, their honors thesis. This was a, a team that worked on the town of Concord in Massachusetts. And what they did was first in the fall semester to reconstitute all the families of Concord uh, from 1650, intensively 1750 up to 1850. And then in the spring they broke apart and they did the demographic, the economic, uh, uh, the political history of the town. And then we got a very small graph from the dean at the end, this was in the old days when, when there was money left over and the deans would actually uh, invite us to spend it. And, and we spent it on this little book. Uh, and uh, the students loved that and many of them have gone on uh, to make history their career out of that experience. Then we did it again, uh, this is the town of Brookline, which was one might say the first American suburb, very different from this sea town. Uh, it was founded uh, in the, in the uh, it was first called Muddy River, and it was, a, it was a, a, I think, also the first American tax shelter. It was by people who wanted to avoid paying Boston taxes. So they moved to Muddy River. And uh, this is this family reconstitution of Muddy River. And then we uh, did it on uh, the island of Nantucket. And then the graduate student who led it wrote this history of Nantucket, pulling all this material together. And then another, a, a friend of ours who teaches now at the University of Michigan, whose name is Maris, Maris Vinovskis. Uh, he's a Latvian American, and he's uh, uh, the, highly developed in, in the use of quantitative methods. And he began to organize the, the, the quantitative data from this 
uh, that is de uh, demographic. Uh, we link that to the tax lists, uh, to the religious uh, records, and all of that. And he put that into regression equations. Maris is known in the history profession as Maris the regressor. <laughs> and what he did was to, um, was to he, he looked to how to explain the when the, how how to explain the, the beginning of uh, of controlled fertility within families in in these local communities, and what variables might explain why that happened. And up to that time, people had been centering on the urbanization, industrialization models, and he found something completely different. He found one variable that had a very high correlation, and it was the education of girls and young women. And uh, that made all the difference. And then that began to reverberate through the literature of demography and into the work on family planning and control all around the world. And uh, my wife, uh, Judy, uh, uh, sitting over here on the side, we've been doing this work together for 50 years since we met in in, in graduate school, and uh, what we, when we were in Ghana, we would go out on our missions early in the morning and we'd see these small groups of young uh, Ghanaian girls on their way to school. And then in the afternoon, we'd see them coming back again, looking very much like American kids on their way to and from. And Ghanaian fertility rates, since this program for the education of women, have been transformed. And it would happen through the act of choice by individual women. And Maris found the key. And he found it in this work. And then we have other work that's going on that's being done in economics. And the central question there is about the sources of economic growth. How is it that economies grow? And, uh, uh, that has long been at the center and I think is increasingly urgent uh, to us uh, today. And here, there were other uh, 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 people. One of them was a student at Brandeis. She, uh, was, uh, she went in the 1940s to Columbia University, got a degree in economics, then married, gave up that career, and came back in the 70s and early 80s. Her name was Winifred Rothenberg. And she began to use this same method, studying local uh, materials, but she looked at other sources. She began to look at account books. And this was a world in early America, here on this island as well as elsewhere, where people maintained a very active market economy without um, money, or with very little money. They did it with a system of mutual sorts of charge accounts. They would maintain account books. Uh, and it was a system that had been called bookkeeping barter. Uh, and everybody in a town would have a page for almost everybody else in the town. And it would be a, 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 a running account of, of, of transactions. And at the end of the year, there'd be a settling up time, usually around Christmas. Uh, and either there'd be some small money that would change hands, or more likely, the balance would be carried forward. And there's so many of these account books that a, a scholar named Thurston Adams in, in Vermont decided to do a price index for Vermont. And he sent out a request for people to send him account books from their families for the 18th and 19th centuries. And the number of account books that came to him was so large that he measured them in tons. He got four tons of account books from farmers in, in Vermont. Uh, and what he did was to compile a price series. But then Winnie went to work, and she looked for the growth of markets in Massachusetts. She studied labor markets, land markets, capital markets. And all of these things were going on in these account books. Some of the people who kept their account books were barely able to read and write. One man used a system of hieroglyphics. He was at a suddenly young time, he said to one of his neighbors, he said, you owe me for a, 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 for a wheel of cheese. He said, I didn't get a wheel of cheese for you. And the guy went back to his account book. He said, oh, I forgot to put the dot in the center of the circle, you owe me for a grindstone. And it, it was, he, was, he was keeping his account books in hieroglyphics. Uh, and, uh, and what Winnie uh, found was that there were some major breaks that happened in the period around the 1780s in these New England towns, in which economic growth really began to take off. And it took off before the national government was formed. 
It took off in a period that was a very difficult period, this so-called critical period. It was a time of troubles like our own time uh, uh, all around the, the, the world. Uh, and uh, she also began to search for what was going on there, what could have been the drivers for economic growth. And she had been trained and then in some ways socialized and even indoctrinated in the ideas of classical economics. And what she found surprised her very much, that, that much of what was happening there was a kind of local form of fixed enterprise. Uh, people were not leaving the market to itself, but they were improvising collective efforts to work their will upon it. That's the way they built their bridges and, and did their roads uh, and, uh, and created many of the conditions for an acceleration of economic growth. And so we see here a new framework for political economy uh, that's rooted in this local thing. And I'll give you one last example, if I can find the book that I meant to bring with me. And um, I think I left it home. But this is about something that would be dear to this college's part and at the center of its mission. It's about the environment. And it's about another uh, 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 one of these uh, students, and his name was Brian Donahue, who was a member of that Concord group. And he wrote the first chapter on the environmental history of Concord. He himself was and is a farmer. Uh, he also um, uh, works the land in other ways. Uh, he, um, as, an, as an undergraduate, managed the town forest of Western Massachusetts that are next to the town where Brandeis is. Uh, and he even persuaded our physical education department, he had to meet a physical education requirement, and he persuaded them that he could use land clearing with a, with a horse team as a, as to meet his physical education requirement, <laughs> which, he, which he did. And then he went on to, um, to reconstruct that town in yet another dimension. What he did was to gather all the deeds in Concord, if you can imagine the heroic labor that he did, and he, he worked out, he invented computer programs. So he could put all of these deeds into a computer, and then he could generate this data in many different forms. He could, uh, he could get it in time series. He could reconstruct the land holdings at any point in time, at any year uh, in, in the history of, of, of concrete. And he was beginning as an environmental historian in the 80s with the model of environmental history then, which was centered on the destruction of the environment. Uh, what went wrong? And what, found, what he found surprised him very much, and it came out of those land deeds. Uh, he discovered that the, the people of Concord, the farmers, had created a system of agriculture that they were able to keep going for more than eight generations there. They did it by managing the flowage on the Concord River. Uh, to, to which they achieved by these methods of, 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 of mixed uh, enterprise. Uh, they began to learn how to use the grass. And the key to it was the grass in Concord. Much of it was about that. And they invented a system of sustainable agriculture, a sustainable ecology that they kept going for more than two centuries in that town. Uh, and. Uh, it greatly revised the work of Bill Cronin. You may know Bill Cronin's work called Changes in the Land. And one of the great admirers of, of Brian's work, Bill Cronin, and, uh, and we're seeing a transformation in the large problems that are being uh, 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 studied in small uh, uh, places. That phrase uh, comes from a wonderful guy named Charles Joyner. Everybody below the Mason Dixon line knows him as Chaz. He's interested in finding out how people of African and European origin were able to live together uh, in, in America, and in, in a particular part of America, which was the Waccamaw River Valley, a beautiful river that flows north to south, just inland from the Atlantic Ocean, just inland from Myrtle Beach, uh, uh, South Carolina. And he did local history to work out the answers to those questions basing much of it on interviews uh, of his own and of uh, others before him. Uh, and then he tried to tell the story. And he told it with, in such a gripping way that the, the doctoral dissertation was published and began to be sold 
in Piggly Wiggly grocery stores <laughs> in South Carolina by the thousands of copies of, the, of, uh, of this wonderful book called Down by the Riverside reached a huge public and still does uh, today. So that's why local history is hot. And then the great question here is, what might be hot about local history here? Uh, where could these large questions uh, uh, come together with a, 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 a serious and a, a, a history of the, of, of the island uh, itself? And that's our next round. And shall we pause for a little bit and then move on to that? But any thoughts or questions before we move on to Mount Desert Hill? <clears throat> you mentioned reconstituting families. What does that mean? Well, what it means is, first of all, to take uh, vital records, which are gathered from many different places, uh, 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 mostly from family Bibles, uh, from uh, from uh, 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 from uh, from cemetery records. Uh, this work has been has been happening recently on the island. It, 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 Mr. Binding, I don't I've never met Mr. Binding. Uh, many of you will know know his compilations that he, he's just done a, he recently did a volume on the cemetery records of, of, the, of the island. And so these materials, it takes quite a long time to gather these things. And then when they are gathered, we begin by reconstructing the family from its vital dates, the birth, marriage, death, primarily. And then we try to flesh that out with other sorts of economic and, and uh, land records, whatever we can find that way. And it, be, it, it becomes, first of all, it's a, a single sheet. Uh, what the demographers want to know is the history of fertility. So much of it centers on that. Other people want to know the engagement of the family in the town and uh, patterns of marriage with, with these other groups. And so it, so the one sheet then becomes a sheaf, which sometimes becomes a, almost a volume in it. In itself, and that's the way family, the, the way the family reconstitution happens. So. And I think a lot of that, actually, the, the technology and the way that it's changed over the past couple of years, the ability for sharing to go on across geographic lines with, you know, various communication technologies like the internet and database technologies, yeah. have made those types of records accessible for people who might be doing quantitative style work or other profiling work from across different disciplines and across different regions. And that also allows for groups of people to come together to do their own individual projects just on recording. So I mean, the first step in that process before you even it's analyze that data is to actually record it or to get it into a usable format. I just read in the, the Bangor paper a couple of days ago about a school program where some students did a grave documentation program where they did exactly what you're talking about, going in uh, and identifying all of the different gravestones, dates, et cetera, coding that for a particular community. And I think that's that people being able to do that and load it up into a kind of a, a format that's easily accessible, that's something that in the past five or 10 years, I think is probably really transforming or opening new pathways. For yeah, to I think that's where well, this method was invented just before the, uh, the computer and the internet revolution. Right. And then it has been reinvented in, in, in just that way. And uh, this I, uh, is, I think, happening here and it's, uh, uh, and it, uh, it, it, it could happen with several groups. One would be with groups of students. The others would be uh, groups in, in the, uh, the historical societies. But uh, our students were able to do this to Nantucket, to reconstitute the families of Nantucket in a, in a semester. And Nantucket was just about the size of the population of Mount Desert Island uh, in the mid-19th century, about 4,000 4, people. And, um, uh, that's that's reachable uh, here. Uh, so the, the scale is just is, is, is right, and um, uh, and and the records of the hard work of the cemetery uh, inscriptions uh, is it, already well is already well along. Well, well, one problem that I can see uh, is as more and more families choose cremation and scattering of ashes and avoiding placement of solid memorials, we're going to have to rely much more heavily on the printed matter in the obituary pages than we have before. I think that's exactly right. And, and now we also have the vital registration records that are, uh, stead have been steadily uh, improving. And uh, some of the, the earliest efforts at, at, at keeping vital statistics were here in New England. Uh, 
they were never quite on a scale with the Irish priests of Quebec, who uh, uh, had, a, had a much higher standard of accuracy. Than, uh, than, uh, than, but we, we have all of those records together. Uh, and there, one of the major problems is the linking one to another and with different answers in different materials that require. Jeff, we Jeff? Yes. Um, on the question of uh, reconstituting families and thinking locally, there's certainly good news. Uh, Sheldon Goldthwaite and Mr. Stanley have community genealogies with 60 and 70,000 records, uh, and they have been done scrupulously well. Uh, but I think there's also, if reconstitution means genetic truth, obvious questions. We confront Napoleon's quip that history is a lie agreed to. And some of the lines alleging begotting probably aren't. Uh, and so I'm interested in how you deal with those kinds of questions in the historical work of family reconstitution. I, a, a large part of it is about the evaluation of the, of, of the source, you say. Uh, that was a, it's a great surprise and also a great learning experience for the for students who were who are in, in, involved in, in that. And I think of, a large, there are many tests, of, well, a large part of the, of the French um, of the, of the literature on, on how to do these things is about how to assess the quality of the, of, of the, of the data, which mostly means uh, looking for internal consistencies and inconsistencies. It could be a tremendous leap forward on MDI history just from 1761 to the beginning of the Civil War, from zero to 4,000 people. Yes. Uh, and Knowing that four or five generations, we line by line would be wonderful. Now I think that's I think that's the way forward for uh, for everybody. That is for all the different groups that come to this to this work. They could agree on that. Rich, David, you mentioned education as being sort of the key predictor variable for family science determination. Is that what what constitutes education? Is that it's Institutional education, is that some form of self-education? And is that a continuous variable, or are there sort of thresholds? Uh, what, what, Mar what Maris did was to work with this question mainly by ecological comparisons of rates of school attendance with rates of fragility for all the towns in Massachusetts. Uh, and so it, mainly, it was mainly school, uh, school attendance. There was very little school attendance by girls in New England schools before about 1750. And then suddenly it begins to take off. There's an early feminist movement before all the other feminist movements that emerges from this data. When we also discover one thing that emerged from this record, the, 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 the demographic stuff, was e evidence of the infant mortality that we found that um, in the 17th century, early 18th century, the infant mortality of, of female babies was much higher than male babies. Though most people today who study this observe that there is a kind of physiological or biological uh, uh, bias that goes to the other direction. Uh, and uh, then around 1750, just about the time girls go to school, that pattern disappears. And we get, uh, uh, we get a period when, a, a short period, when the rates of, of mortality are very much the same in the first year of life for both, uh, for both female and, and, and male. And then by the 19th century, the biological pattern is, is pretty much uh, established where there's a slight excess of mortality for male babies. And most people who study this conclude that probably the only way to make sense of this is that in the 17th century, this was female infanticide of the second degree. It wasn't the, it wasn't the sort of infanticide that would be in ancient Greece or in other societies, uh, which would be in the first degree. But they just, uh, these were families that didn't take such good care of their girl babies. And then the amazing thing to me is that suddenly that changed in the mid 18th century. There was a revolution, which I think was a revolution of values, of the revolution in the mind. And we find it uh, correlated with other sorts of data, such as school attendance. And all, that's the sort of thing that students discover and scholars as they begin to work with the possibilities in the state. It just keeps on growing as to what we what what, what people can, can do with that. Uh, Phil. Uh, 
you were talking about cemeteries, I'm just wondering in family reconstitution if cartography or map making has a role too. It does. And uh, we have, for some New England map, some New England towns, uh, my town in particular, it's now called Wayward, it was founded as Sudbury. It was one of the first two towns that were settled off the coast in, in Massachusetts. And um, we have maps that have the last names of every householder uh, at about 100 year intervals from 1670 to our own time. And we can observe uh, how, the, from that cartographic evidence, how these, uh, what we found, first of all, is that there was a kind of nucleated center that it, as there were in most of the so-called covenanted towns. But then most people by the 1670s were living in hamlets. And gradually, the people who lived in these hamlets appear on the maps as having the same last names. That's often the, the, the boys would acquire a, a property, inherited property. The girls would get movables, and they'd move away. So uh, everybody on Rice Road in Wayland, Massachusetts, was named Rice over the year 1776 in, these, in this little cluster, almost everybody. And that goes on up to about, uh, something some we can't quite tell because of these long intervals between the maps, but something like 1815, 1790, 1815, the direction of change changes. And these, fat, these local hamlets begin to be much more diverse in, in the naming. And now it's very rare for anybody in the town to have the same last name as one of these neighbors. And we can see a transformation in the association patterns as they become increasingly concentric and very tightly centered. And then they become increasingly the other way. And, uh, and this data allows us, uh, in the use of, of, of the local maps, to, to do that. But. Well, here on the island, um, <clears throat> one saw somewhat the same thing in the village of Otter Creek. And there used to be an old joke that if your last name wasn't Walls, it probably should be. <laughs> and uh, between the Walls and the Richardsons, uh, that made up the bulk yes. of householders in Otter Creek when I was a child uh, at the time of the Second War. Uh, but Otter Creek is now becoming gentrified, and we're getting a lot more people from away, and so the old names are no longer yes. in the ponderance. I, I, I think that, that has been observed in some larger, uh, in, in, the, in the city of Philadelphia. They were saying, you know, I correct my pronunciation, that it was said that everybody in Philadelphia in the early 18th, by the mid 19th century was either a, a beige or a son of a beige. <laughs> 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 it's possible you've been answering this question all along, but my uh, question is, in an environment where history, the study of history can be influenced by demand, on Mount Desert Island there's a great deal of history available about the Gilded Age and the founding of Acadia National Park, and my question is, what areas do you think we ought to be exploring um, yeah, maybe we could take that question as a segue into the our next, uh, 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 which is get into the history of, uh, of the island uh, in, 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 in around the way. Then, if you have other questions, we, we can come back to them at the end or after the after the end. But what would be what would be the what, the, the, the answer? What would be some of the the most promising areas of inquiry uh, uh, into the? In, in, into the history. Let me make a quick uh, and, uh, a stab at my own and then everybody else way. But I would suggest two uh, possibilities here, well, two sets of possibilities. One is that we think about, I, 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 I think in terms of maybe four or five um, waves of, of here, one would be uh, the Indians. Another would be the, uh, the, uh, the uh, New England families that uh, begin to move in the mid uh, 18th century. Uh, a third uh, would be the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the people from away, the, the rusticators, uh, the cottagers, uh, uh, that um, uh, a, a fourth, uh, our friend Walter Norwood uh, describes of other groups who are beginning to appear on the island. One of them he calls the comebackers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that's a very interesting uh, phenomenon. And we're clearly getting yet another wave that's very much, um, uh, 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 that's very much, uh, 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 very, very complex. Then add to that one other 
a, a general thought, which is that I think we should talk not only think not only about the island, but about a region around this island. And it's not a very large region, but it's a very interesting and distinctive region, and it emerges from a lot of primary data. Um, and it emerges for all four of those ways. That is, when we look at the Indians, I think one can say that uh, uh, there were many Indian groups uh, uh, who uh, spent some time on the island, and none of them lived on the island all the year round, or very few, probably none. But all of them lived in a region. And, it, and the more we learn about this, well, I got into this in the Champlain book, and there are appendices about this at the back of the book, but we found that for there were the Mi'kmaq, but the Mi'kmaq were not one group. It was a confederation of Mi'kmaq. There's not a, much of a literature on the Mi'kmaq confederacy. The French called them the Souraquois. There were at least eight Mi'kmaq groups with, that, that belonged to that confederacy. And there were, e there were even more complex groups that were the, uh, in, uh, um, in the, the Wabanaki confederacies, uh, and there were quite a number of them. And then there was another group that the Etchemin, the Penobscot, uh, the, the French called them the Etchemin, uh, who, uh, they, they spoke of the people to the south uh, as, uh, uh, as Elmushikwa. That's Champlain's version of their word. And uh, Champlain was told that uh, Elmushikwa meant dogs who raise corn. Uh, and these were, uh, as, as compared with the hunting gathering uh, uh, groups to the north. And all of these groups had some connection with Mount Desert Island. And they were part of this very, very complex regional system of movement and interaction, much of it's what anthropologists call transhumance, where they're moving in a, 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 a patterned way through a year, but there was much more to it than that. They were making war, then they would make trade, and then they would make war, and it would be uh, uh, they, they were very active in, in the way of, of, of trading. They were getting their own, uh, not only their building these larger canoes, but also acquiring you know, European sloops. And they were, they were forestalling the market by meeting the Europeans at sea. Uh, the Indians were doing that in their trading. We get some sense of how complex the trading. This was in the first decade of the 17th century, uh, before any of the, of, of, of the English settlements were here. Uh, and that would be one part of it. And then we can go further and we can see that there are, there's evidence in quite a number of things that there is another region. I, I, would, uh, I should have brought in uh, a, uh, the, a census map of religions in, their, in, in the year uh, 1950. It's a county-based map. And what it shows is huge areas. Almost all of New England is predominantly, it maps the predominant denomination. Almost every county in New England was Roman Catholic in its, in its predominant religion. There is a, a great belt of Methodists that runs across the, uh, the, 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 the middle part. And Baptists without reckoning uh, below the Mason-Dixon line. But the interesting thing is in New England, and there were three counties that did not show that Catholic predominance. And they were Hancock, Waldo and Lincoln counties. And they stand out as a separate religious region in America. It's very striking on these religious maps. In 1950, it tends to become less striking by 1970 or 1990, but it's still there. And this was a kind of, uh, 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 this, was, this was an area that embraced uh, much more than this island but was part of this island, you know, and I think we can see it happening on this island was the year, when did the first covenant happen? 1792, I think it was, um, uh, in, uh, was it Southwest? Uh, it was the, that, the first um, the Congregationalist covenant in that year. Mostly women, as in almost all Christian denominations, signed that covenant. Uh, and uh, uh, men it were a minority of that movement, but there was a there was a there's, there's a there's a regional phenomenon of great strength around here. It still goes on today, uh, and we can see it if we look at the interplay between the island and the region. And then I was going to talk at length. We're running out of time. Long before we run out of this subject. Ten minutes. And uh, well, I was going to thank you, Andy, for.
of that presidential thought. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, this is um, these, this is one of my favorite maps. I I got a, this. I have. Oh, I think I only have twenty copies. So I'll, I'll distribute them. This is a this is like that religious map, but this is speech. Uh, and you'll see there are four large speech regions in America. The red in this case is New England. You can see where the New Englanders went. I'm going to pass those around, Andy, and, and maybe you can double or triple up. I apologize for not having them. But you can see where the New Englanders went. They not only in New England, but then they went up west on a latitude line. They found in Minneapolis, St. Paul, really, uh, uh, Seattle, uh, Portland. Um, uh, that, uh, they, there is th this is uh, this comes. I should explain. This comes from a, a man named Hans Karat, University of Michigan, and it's maybe the largest project of research in American history that's ever been undertaken. He sent out legions of graduate students, and they interviewed people and recorded their pronunciation and also their 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 uh, their vernacular language. That is, uh, I was uh, uh, taught to think of that children's thing as a seesaw. Others uh, call it, in different regions, call it teeter-totter. In Rhode Island, it's called a tippity bounce. <laughs> and that's mapped here. Uh, and that's the basis of, of all of this. And so you'll see this northern, uh, this is the, the, the pat your ca accent here. <laughs> uh, then, then this Midland accent. Then a kind of coastal southern, and then the highly of, 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 what we all think is the Western end. And then there's a small sort of blue stain here around the city of New York. It's a cultural hearth without a hinterland. It never really developed that way. And, but then, if we get further into this, and Hosker Rath has published huge geographies, we can study what happens in detail around here. And the language that the, the, the speechways of this island are very interesting. When we talk with Walter Norwood, he calls, uh, he, he, uh, 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 he speaks of a uh, giarding, giarding, G Y, as if it were spelled G Y A R I N, with a G at the end, giarding. And that's an interesting um, pronunciation because it recurs in other places. It's also on Smith and Tangier Island in the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay. It comes from the west of England. Not from East Anglia, uh, not from the, the, the that uh, it's not the new, East Anglia gave us the uh, gave us the speechway, which which they call the Norfolk wine. It is like pat your cat. It's in the nose. Uh, but this is a, a, this comes from a different place, and we can begin to get clues. We know that this was a very diverse pattern of migration here in in the first English settlers. They came from all over the place. But in the speechways, you begin to get clues as to some of the predominant culture, the way that they mix together. And then we find that there are regional patterns, very much like those religious patterns that I mentioned before, that are in this part of the coast. They're not to be found further uh, down east, it's quite in the same way, or in the opposite direction. And that's another. So here are two frames. One is to think about these four waves, all of which have that same regional pattern, and then to think about the regions themselves as linked to these communities. So, uh, questions? Yeah, that would seem to be related to the work that Robin McNeil did during, um, I guess, it was yes, about 20 years ago. Yes, the story I mean, this is Robert McNeil and the McNeil era report. Yes. Right. Yes. And he did the story of English. I think it was a 13-part yes, section. a second. very uh, serious student of, of he, ministry of language. He yeah. had in one show uh, a Lincolnshire person speaking, and then he segued into a down easter, and you couldn't tell the difference. Yeah. The, uh, the BBC <laughs> has uh, produced tapes of British regional dialects, and uh, hearing is believing when you're listening to this, to, to listen to you. Yeah, uh, I appreciate already your response to Tim's big question. Two more thoughts. Uh, I would love to see the discipline of bookkeeping barter brought to the first three or four generations of European settlement from Soames and Bartlett and Richardson on through you know, 
Jacksonian period. I think that would be profoundly fertile. The question is, what have we got to work from yeah, there absolutely. on this island? Are, are there have people um, uh, uh, are account books in the in the uh, in, in the various? We uh, have stacks of account books at the uh, Mount Desert Island cool. Historical Society. We have quite a quite a collection, not tons. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think that's one of the one of the reasons why the Friends of Island History Coalition and the other groups are coming together is because I think there was a recognition. Ironically, that actually that type of coalition building and, and collaborative work among the different actors was started by people who were doing wanted to do research and, for lack of a better term, found it frustrating that they there was not a good way to know where everything was. Yeah. And so the idea would be, and I think that this is one of the first steps, is to get the different. Archive, archival collections together, individual families, people who may want to donate things, but also to, to be able to, I don't want to say inventory those, but to provide a good accounting of what may exist so that people can begin to do work using that, that what I think is actually a wealth of material to start with. I think the island is a huge wealth of those kind of materials um, that are stored in various locations, yeah. piles here, piles there. And then the question is how we both provide an accounting of where they're at, perhaps you know, do digitization and preservation efforts to make sure that they can be used for, for multiple generations. I, I think that that's going on and getting back to some of the big questions idea. You know, it's not the work that I do, which I can talk a little bit about later, but I know that in terms of some of the environmental history work that's being done here on the island, on uh, some of the agricultural history work. I know Todd Little Siegel, who uh, teaches history here, he couldn't be here today because he's actually uh, left for a conference in Guatemala, does a lot of agricultural history work going back and using some old log books, journals. Uh, they did a project, Dylan, you may know a little bit more about this, where they identified so many, uh, so like 50 or 60 or 70 varietals of the apples that, they, that used, to, used to exist in this region going back using these old farmer farmers' logs and journal entries and seed catalogs and things like that. So I do think that there's a wealth of those that exist here. I know that the folks over on uh, Canada, some of our environment historians, folks are beginning to look at utilizing those. We have some people here, uh, some students who are working, graduate students working uh, with Acadia, with the park, uh, has a new uh, uh, gentleman on board who is in science education but really wants to focus on doing environmental history as part of it, going through archives, looking for those types of of, of data that could be, I, I don't do quantitative work, but it could be. Yeah, and, and uh, that, like a quick suggestion, which we could uh, ask Winnie Rothenberg to come up here. And, uh, and uh, she is plugged into a network of, uh, of other scholars who work with account books. And uh, on top of that, Woody does very serious economics. Her, uh, this, this dissertation in, um, in history uh, won, I think it was the Clark Medal in economics. Uh, uh, because it has such a reach in, in, in that. Invite uh, Brian Donahue to come up if anybody wants to talk about the deeds. And that's a huge task, not to be undertaken. Well, the towns but, on the island are becoming more alike. Well, the towns on the island are becoming more alike. More alike? I, that's, I don't know that. I think others in, the, in this room could answer that question. Uh, more, I, uh, my impression is that there is increasing diversity on this island, but it doesn't follow town boundaries. That is that um, I'm astounded by the number of different uh, ethnic, small, or uh, different groups that multiply. Some amongst the summer people, these are uh, these East European um, refugees who moved to some of the, would summer on some of the, 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 the lakes, the ponds. Uh, on this island. Uh, I, I can't be more specific about that, but I, I, I've met and talked with some of them. Uh, the, 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 the people who live in Otter Creek. Or I just don't know if I looking into that. Yeah, I think that would work on, not only for summer people, but for people who are here full, full time as, as well. Uh, uh, I mean, we still do have a fairly distinct divide between East Siders and West mm -hmm. Siders. So the quiet side, or I, I don't think this is a nice name. There's some people call it the backside, and I don't think that's very polite. <laughs> but there does seem to be a, a very distinct difference between people who live on the different halves. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. But there wasn't it the case that in the uh, 18th and early 19th century, the quiet side was the east side. Yeah. Is that, I'm going to agree that. Right? So, uh, Ken. I just, I, both of you are educators, Jamie and David, and I'm wondering, do you think, 
but without overgeneralizing, it seems like history in high school, maybe it's because the No Child Left Behind program focuses on math and reading, or maybe it's because we have, we've got a generation of people who live in the moment and don't think about history, but it seems like using local history may be a way of engaging younger students to then make history relevant. I think that's that, absolutely right, is, right. Have you seen that happening in yes. places that are successful? Do you think that that's a model that could be replicated? It's not only local history, but it's also family history. It's the two together. And we had a conference in Boston for early art historians, and everybody agreed that the best session in the conference was put on by uh, teachers in the public schools of Boston. Uh, and even as they have to teach to the exams, uh, they teach um, uh, uh, to their students as well. And often it will be a combination of ethnic, local, in this case, neighborhoods in Boston, and getting them, encouraging them to get into family history and all of that. I think, yes, I, I think that's a very powerful way of getting people interested. And we now have the, the center for this is the New England Historic and Genealogical Society which was a very tight and closed institution in its early years, and now has transformed itself. It, is, it, it reaches out to all ethnic groups. We had a gathering of its supporters, I think, filled the grand ballroom in the, in the Four Seasons Hotel, and, 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 uh, and much of it is about the, the extraordinary growth of interest in, in family history, which also becomes an interest in, in local history. So, Yes, it's, uh, it's both for students, but also for people in, e in every uh, stage of life, uh, getting engaged. Uh, I think we have time for two more questions, and if people want to stay longer, we can, <coughs> the facility is certainly available, but I think some of you have obligations to move on. I, I do just want to add one quick question, that maybe one element to that, which I do think that, you know, we can talk about how K-12 education, which I'll left behind, and what pressure exists for, for teachers to teach to be the remotes. Clearly, you know, the idea of history not just is some of the seed story, also students engaging with primary artifacts. That's great, but there's an additional level to it that I think the doing of that kind of historical research work, the going and the taking on of individual projects, I think there's a real pedagogical value to that, regardless of if people go on to be historians or whatever they go on to do. I think, the, uh, I think sometimes the ability for students to actually take on a project that excites them, to find, quote unquote, something new. I, I sometimes think of, when I do my own work, and this sounds ridiculous, but it's the like unexplored continent in a way. <laughs> like I'm actually exploring something that has not, or, or uh, finding something that is missing or has been lost, and that keeps it interesting for me in a lot of ways. I mean, the projects I work on are more narrowly defined than some of the bigger picture questions that I think, you know, historians tend to ask. But I think even for a, a young student, it, uh, even at the college level, I'm not, I can only speak to that on the K through 12 level, to say, hey, we have this project where we're trying to reconstitute someone's life or find these speeches or answer this particular question. And we know it's there. And it's going to be up to you to really get into those archives or go track down these, these collections or open that box in that finding aid. That can really be exciting for them and can push them to, to give them a reason to want to keep doing the work, right? Um, and I, that's really, I think that's great at the K through 12 level. I think it's great at the college level. I really enjoy working with students added value regardless of what the actual output is. Henry Kevin Lodge has one sentence in his early memoirs. He took a course with Henry Adams in Anglo-Saxon land law, <laughs> which was not a subject of burning interest to him. But he said, in that course, quote, I discovered serious thought as a new sensation. And I always laughed at that and thought that's, a, that's an inspiration for, for us for us all. So, yeah. uh, Every once in a while, you stumble up against a fact that tends to change how you think about even local history. 1906, decade of strong labor activism across the country. Where do we think the largest proportion of unionized workers in Maine was? Portland? No. Lewiston Harbor? No. Biddeford Saka? No. Mount Desert Island? Amazing. I, Granite workers I, and even more construction trades. Think of the people in the picture of the turrets construction crew. Very likely organized. And I think we know very little about something that may be a really substantial part of even that period of Mount Island history. 
and with a, also with a strong ethnic uh, component. Certainly with the granite workers, yes. Or your construction trades are probably a little more local. The Historical Society has been working with the local schools here and has developed a program uh, of a trunk show which we take into the local schools. Uh, and then we even had a program where uh, children were encouraged to do oral histories of their grandparents and the oldest members of their families. And this seems to be rekindling an interest among the young about the past. One, one last question. Yes. Um, where would you suggest we might start pulling together some common threads among comebackers? Among, among the comebackers? Among the comebackers. Uh, I mean, uh, there are a lot of us. And I mean, where would we start pulling together some of these threads? Well, I think I'd start with, uh, I'd get some sort of oral history project going, interviewing. Comebackers. I have a feeling that one comebacker will lead to another. Oh, I mean, <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah, they're probably grow that. Room anywhere, I, I, but I also make it one, one last suggestion, which I think that the, the great way forward here is for the interlocking of the college and the community. It's for uh, this institution and this island and the kind of partnership here, and we can see that working here in this room today. And I would say that's the that's the way, way forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.